So now we are all set, we can start. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to you all to our second event of the new seminar series called the Challenges for Bank Board Members, which is organized by the Florida School of Banking and Finance. My name is Elena Carretti. I'm a professor of finance at the Bocconi University, but I'm also a non-executive director of Unicredit. So I very much also play the role of learning today and in the series as to what a good member is. I will be chairing today's debate on the topic of governance and oversight, lessons from Wirecard. So let me first of all welcome our speaker, James Fries. I think we all know him. He is the former CEO of Wirecard, appointed in June 2020. He was initially appointed as a responsible within the board for integrity, legal and compliance. But then after he exposed internal fraud, he was appointed the CEO and he had to deal with the fraud that sort of he discovered. But he will tell us a lot about this data. It's also worth mentioning his previous experiences. Maybe we all don't know that. He was the managing director, chief compliance officer and the group anti-money laundry officer for Deutsche Börse Group in Frankfurt. And before that, he was director of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network within the US Treasury Department. And before that, he was at the Fed. So he has a long experience in the field of, let me say, integrity, anti-money laundry, financial sections, and so on, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. Now, before giving the floor to James, let me spend a few words um, on the new seminar series that the Florence School has created entitled Challenges for Bank Board Members. As we know, this series has started two weeks ago with the first seminar with Elizabeth McCall and Lorenzo Benismaghi on the expectations on our supervisor expectation on board members. The, se the series will entail one seminar per month. The next one will be on January 21st on the topic credit risk after COVID. And as speakers, we will have Jose Manuel Campa, who is the chairperson of the EBA, Clara Yandova, who is a partner of Oliver Wyman. And also we will have a chair of a risk committee of a bank, of a European bank. And the seminar will be chaired by Professor Tossenberg. Registration is already open and you can find more information uh, on the Florence School webpage. Let me conclude by saying that the seminar series is one pillar of the new FBF Bank Board Academy for non-executive director. The second pillar of this initiative will be a true training program that will start in June 2021 on the topic, better checks and controls of risks. So the, the training will be on a topic that is very close to today's debate. And indeed, James will be again with us as an instructor on that occasion. Let me now start to the seminar of today. So the debate will reflect upon three big categories of topics. The first will reflect upon broader wildcard lessons for boards and for banks in having an efficient corporate governance framework with effective control functions. Second, it will discuss financial reporting and auditing deficiencies and inefficiencies legal and procedural impediments in supervising and enforcing financial information. And thirdly, we consider alternatives for the overall supervisory system from a whistleblowing mechanism to the supervisory architecture in Europe. Now, in terms of organization, James will have initially the floor for about 10, 15 minutes maximum, and then we will again have Q&A sessions. So we would very much like to involve the audience. We want to engage in a, in, a, in a conversation with him. So please feel free again to post your question in the Q&A bottom bar. Of course, all of you are uh, warmly invited to pose your question, but I would very much like to encourage the board members that are connected with us today to intervene and use the possibility to pose questions to James on their, uh, on their duties as board member of banks, because that is the overall objective of this series. Now you understand that today, um, today topic is very sensitive. The wildcard investigation is still going on. So let me somehow say some rules for asking questions to James today. So we should all understand that in light of the extraordinary circumstances of the wildcard case and the ongoing investigation, James may not be able to address all topics in detail. In light of this, first of all, we really greatly appreciate that he has agreed to be with us today 
but he has agreed to focus his presentation on aspects which he believes may have broader implications that go beyond wildcard. Implications for board of directors in financial institutions seeking to ensure good governance and that they properly carry out their oversight function. So with that in mind, I would like to ask the audience to pose a question to James, but try to limit the question to topics that he can address within this overall framework of the seminar. And now let me stop talking and let me give finally the floor to James. Thanks again for being with us today. This is really appreciated and the floor is now yours. We look forward to, to the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm very pleased to support the uh, broader initiatives of the Frankfurt School of Banking and Finance, as you say, both with this talk today and in the important aspect of the trainings for board members going forward. Uh, it's something that I've done various parts of my, my career as a regulator and member of the industry, and it's uh, part of my own personal commitment to continue to focus on improving governance. And that's why I think that the discussion today, one of many that I've been engaged in recently and will continue, what we can learn from the experience with Wirecard. First, what I would like to do is provide a little bit of that background or put it in the, the context for this audience focused on banking boards. So Wirecard Group, Wirecard AG, the mother company was incorporated in Germany, is still incorporated in Germany, and itself is not regulated as a banking institution or a financial services provider. Rather, it had a, a fully licensed bank subsidiary as well as multiple other entities around the world that are licensed as financial services providers, e-money institutions, among other uh, names. But it was known broadly as a type of fintech. So what I can suggest is there are at least three or four different ways that there are correlations of relevance for those here sitting on bank boards. It's a bank board within a group, and I'll make uh, many uh, examples of that particular context. It's an aspect of challengers to banks, fintechs, whether they should be regulated, particularly when they're providing bank competitive services. And here we're talking about a payment services provider. It's also an aspect that in providing those services, this institution worked extremely closely with banks. It was a service uh, provider and its very business model is one that banks also rely upon to serve their customers. And then an aspect of how the regulation is evolving. So again, I'll try to, to draw things uh, of relevance uh, for bank directors or, or focus on those and aspects uh, that are of good corporate governance, including for publicly listed companies. And then another aspect of factual background, Wirecard, uh, now is going through insolvency proceedings. So its market value has fallen greatly. But uh, last year, before the current circumstances started, its market capitalization peaked at around 24 billion euros. And it actually replaced Commerzbank as one of the blue chip companies in the German DAX index. So meaning that it was one of the top 30 by valuation uh, market capitalization companies in Germany. And in that case, one of the largest financial services provider in Europe. It also had a global business model. So in addition to its headquarters in Germany and passporting throughout the EU, it had operations in 26 countries uh, around the world, including in North America, in uh, South America with the headquarters in Brazil, 
in the Middle East out of the Dubai, Singapore for its Asian hub and all the way to Australia and New Zealand, south to South Africa. So truly a global business. And again, that raises other aspects of questions how to oversee uh, a group with multiple legal subsidiaries and operating cross-border beyond just the aspects of where the headquarters or the, the primary bank was licensed. In terms of the specific services it provided, it broke down, including in its public financial reporting, three different business lines but the overwhelming one was the acquiring activity. And what I can best do is describe this by example. So it's very classic type of banking activity, whether we call it uh, forfeiting uh, among other terms, but basically one of the strengths of the Wirecard model is it did payments processing for airlines when they were selling tickets online, something that uh, business that's gone down in this past year with people uh, not, not traveling. But again, this was one of its leading global businesses. So if any of us were to go on the internet and purchase a ticket, whether it was for KLM and, or Air France or for Singapore Airlines or for Qatar Airways, some of the, the big global names, and you were paying in essentially any currency, accessing this through almost any language uh, portal and very different payments mechanisms. Of course, the major credit card schemes, whether MasterCard, Visa, American Express, JCB, as well as some of the regional equivalents, but also more modern payment technology, including that by non-financial service or, or by non-bank providers, whether it's from your PayPal account, your Google wallet, your Alipay in China. What Wirecard would do is it would advance funds to the merchant, in this case, the airline providers, and then go back the chain of banks to collect back to where the individual consumer had its uh, account. And that's a basic model of the so-called uh, acquiring business of a payment service provider. It was, of course, a growing business, including through some of the transformations this year because Wirecard's business model was to do this digitally. It provided the, the point of sale terminals that we see at uh, merchants, including online services through just the computer interface. But as people increasingly in the past uh, months have been ordering things online from home that they used to do from stores, it was a growing business model and one extremely scalable on a global basis. So that was the uh, acquiring business, the, the vast majority for Wirecard. The issuing business is when customers advance funds to a specific entity and it holds customer deposits that are then drawn down. Drawn down. The way that business began was what we all recall telephone cards. If you bought a prepaid card for, for telephones, Today, it's mostly what we refer to as mobile wallets. When we have uh, a cryptographic savings uh, account where funds are pre-placed and then drawn down. For instance, one of the things Wirecard offered around this time of year very actively last year with a, a lot of global companies is, is bonuses or type of holiday uh, payments, uh, gift cards that were given out to their staff. Again, if it's a 100 euro card, you have the ability to draw that down at merchants over the course of the year. And then the third aspect of its business was related to servicing the online systems, uh, the, the help desks uh, and the like. So that gives you a, a little bit of an idea 
again, this is what people refer to as a FinTech because at the headquarters level, Wirecard was essentially a technology company. In order to provide these services to customers and to acquire funds from the individual merchants, it required bank licenses um, and or various financial services providers, including e-money licenses to hold consumer funds. And of course, any issuer of a credit card needs to have a, a bank license or a bank sponsor and, and Wirecard did provide those services as well. So a lot of interaction with banks and a uh, competitor to traditional banking services, overwhelmingly on a business to business uh, basis. It also provided some payment services directly for consumers, but on a smaller level. So why did Wirecard come into the press in the, the past year in, in brilliant form? Uh, essentially, there were allegations of financial irregularities. So what do I mean by that? Uh, allegations that Wirecard had inflated its revenue through these streams and uh, with a focus on the biggest one, the acquiring business, and in turn had inflated its profits. Those aspects were relevant for the market capitalization of the company. A highly profitable company is valued more and uh, led to its, its rise, as I mentioned, into the blue chip indices. But it also was relevant, so that's the equity financing side, but also relevant for the borrowing side. Wirecard had a few public issuances of debt obligations, bonds, and it had significant revolving credit facilities from its banks, which relied at least in significant part on these uh, revenue and profitability calculations. When I came into the, the company in June, the auditors were looking or were raising questions and had concerns about signing off on the financial statements. The audited financial statements was one of the requirements for the banks that were lending to Wirecard and uh, for the rollover of its credit facilities. It had revolving credit facilities in the middle of the year of 1.3 billion euros that were coming due. And when I filed for insolvency in late June, the banks had to take losses on uh, those loans. I had to write them down as a minimum as non-performing uh, loans and put together provisions. For some of Europe's largest banks, those losses in Q2 of this year were their largest single loss items exceeding the write downs that they had for COVID potential uh, provisions. So that gives you an idea of the repercussions and how that impacted also the broader uh, banking uh, industry. In addition to those aspects of inflated financial statements, there are also ongoing investigations into more classical aspects of fraud that uh, management had uh, abused their positions within the company for self-enrichment purposes. And in this case, it was more classical vehicles of fraud. So for instance, the typology that uh, anyone in protecting a, a bank should well know that you have a consulting contract, but whether services were actually provided or provided in the, the form that uh, they are suggested in those invoices, um, or at least without conflicts of interest in providing them is a, a questionable aspect, but you can easily provide an invoice as a consultant and then have funds paid out. Or another aspect that you see 
in uh, multiple press accounts is that as Wirecard grew, it had a combination of organic growth along a uh, scale and also acquisitions of subsidiaries. In the course of some of those acquisitions, there were questions as to whether the price was inflated and in as payments went out, there were uh, even court cases over the fact that the sellers claimed that they did not get the full value of the transaction, that some of the purchase price was diverted. Um, and it's a question of who that was, including allegations that uh, the former management might have been involved and enriched themselves uh, through payments going out from the company. So that, of course, has raised very serious concerns, especially when we talk from the perspective here of boards in terms of governance and oversight. You have multiple different parties whose roles have been called into question, the financial regulators and supervisors, including the point we can come to a little bit later as to whether this activity should have been overseen more directly in licensing. You have the aspect of the governance functions within the organization, the supervisory board and the management. And you have the aspects of the internal and the external control functions, in particular, the external auditors who had signed off on the financial statements over a period of years. Now these allegations raise questions as to the validity of those statements, not just in the past year, but as they built over a period of years. Put another way, I will posit to you that multiple parties could and should have identified these irregularities over a period of years. And I say that uh, being the person who came in and with his first, within his first day and over the course of his first week, uh, identified and disclosed uh, a range of these failures that to me were obvious evidence of fraud based on a career in the, the banking industry and some very basic banking principles because the frameworks or individual structures that were brought to my attention were not plausible. By that I say, regardless of how it was documented, regardless of who was involved, under basic banking principles, the financial setups did not make any sense in terms of the commercial incentives behind them for the amounts that were involved for tens, of mil tens or hundreds of millions, or in some cases up to billions of values. I would posit that none of your other banks would have been involved in setting up structures that again were allowed to persist over a period of years. So let me just stop there for, for a second in, in terms of uh, setting the, the scene, but, but welcome with uh, Elena's help to try and talk about some aspects that we think are again, broader uh, implications for your roles, uh, both from the side of governance and oversight. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot to James for these introductory remarks. So let me say that we have already a number of questions from the audience, but before we get to the audience, let me maybe go back a little bit to some of the things that you said and, uh, and go a little bit deeper uh, on some of the aspects. The first one is your appointment to Wirecard. So in a way, I got to know you a few years ago as a chief compliance officer in Deutsche Börse, and then suddenly I saw you in Wirecard. So how did you come to Wirecard and what was your intended role? Because somehow the company, as you say, was doing very well. But on the other hand, your appointment was especially meant for integrity of the company. So there was already ideas that something was going wrong or why were, how did you end up there? Absolutely. So I guess the way that I, uh, I had approached the, the company. I was personally looking for a change. As you say, I was in Frankfurt for, for six years and had established the framework for the systemically significant financial market infrastructures, including four banks uh, across the Deutsche Börse group and making sure that we met all of those regulatory requirements on a 
global basis. And I was looking for a potential change. Wirecard was also looking to essentially professionalize its management. It was a originally a fintech organization, as I explained, had grown up over the years, increasing revenue, but part of its strategic, in fact, its most important strategic step going forward was to acquire further banking licenses and move up the financial sector change. If you are providing the technology service to a bank, you have a certain fee. If you are able to collect the fee for the first payment with a bank license, then you've essentially doubled your, your revenue immediately. And I was coming in to put more of a bank-like governance framework over the organization, including with new applications for banking licenses. So I would have come in and uh, arranged the type of regulatory college, approaches would have sat on the uh, boards probably as the, the chairman of the subsidiary banks and to establish the appropriate three lines of defense model across the organization, which otherwise does not apply directly to a technology holding group. In a way, you're trying to establish best practices. So maybe talking a, a little bit of, of that and how the newly appointed chairman of the board from the early point of this year uh, was looking to strengthen the management team, not just uh, myself as considering uh, one or, or two additional uh, appointees. And I'll talk about this in the context of board members requirements and looking at suitability and the strength of your management team. It's important to realize the obligations upon all of us as, as board members, not just to look at individual members, but also the strengths of the management and supervisory board teams as a whole. And also as we look across specific committees, for instance, the audit committee, there, there was no audit committee previously in, in place before recent months at Wirecard. Again, not required specifically for the holding company level, but a best practice and something that would be required in its regulated subsidiaries. Wirecard itself, when you look at uh, diversity, one might say it was actually quite uh, a good company from a social perspective. For that, I mean, three of six uh, positions on the supervisory board were held by, by women, one of four members on the management board. But I can say uh, someone who's always uh, supported aspects of diversity, diversity is something that we require in terms of experience, critical for a management team and critical for the members of the supervisory board. If we looked at Wirecard from an external perspective, we could see that all the members of the management board had spent essentially their whole careers within the company. Uh, three Austrians and, and one German now running a global enterprise and within their supervisory board as well a chairman who had been in that position for 12 years from a very small company that had grown up. And by all external measures, based on the position that it had attained as a global size, its market capitalization, it needed greater experience in that board. And I think one of the aspects when we look for diversity, we really must look at the aspect of whether persons have the diversity of experience in which knowing the institution and knowing its, its business, including through continuity is useful. But when you look at people who've been there for a very long time, especially in such a rapidly transforming industry, a FinTech disruptor, 
we could see that there were a lack of external perspectives until recently. And again, I attribute that to one of the reasons why I could come in and immediately say that interesting um, or shocking that the way many aspects of the organization are run are contrary to the way it's ever been in the six different places where I've worked over the course of my career and not consistent with best practices for governance. So that aspect of a, a fresh perspective um, and uh, bringing in new ideas and challenging uh, old ideas is, is something that was missing and that was part of my role to come in. Okay, let me move forward. Although this diversity topic is a topic that we have also touched upon in the previous seminar, because uh, some of the audience uh, participants in that occasion in particular pointed to the fact that, for example, and given this was a fintech, we need also people in the board that are coming from technology sector like Google, Amazon, or more big tech uh, type of board. But of course, that is a little bit in contrast with having people in the board that instead are very experienced of the banking business itself. Because as you say, in this case, particular Wirecard, this was an important element to have people that really knew the business and could detect what was going on within the company, which leads to the question, what is the optimal number than a board? Should we enlarge the board side in order to have more diversity? But maybe let's stop with the topic because I see that there are already lots of questions and I would like to ask kindly to pose short questions because some of them are really long. I, I don't really have a chance even to read them. So please try to be brief. Before going to the audience though, let me come, go one point back and then maybe we see whether we want to already open the audience question. You mentioned one aspect that was also touched in the last um, seminar, which is the fact that the banks operate in a group structure. Now, in this particular case, uh, Wirecard, as you said, was a bank within a group that where the head company was not a bank. But many times we have uh, groups, I mean, banks operating in groups that maybe they're only bank groups, but they operate across many, very many legal entities. And we know that it's always difficult to control the legal entities, in particular the small ones. So what recommendation would you have to apply then to this kind of situation? When we have banks within a, a group, including a regulated group, it, it's important to keep in mind the fiduciary responsibilities that are held for the directors and managers on each of the different legal entities. I think it's one of the aspects that was what I would say uh, is a weakness at the Wirecard side, but one that I think, again, is a type of lessons learned throughout the organization. As a matter of guidance that we have from, from ABA, among others, um, ABA ESMA, the, you can consider group mandates as one within subsidiary entities. And that leads to the fact that sometimes you have managers that will be on seats of multiple different entities. But it's also relevant if there are requirements for some of those subsidiaries to have non-executives that the, the non-executives can really challenge and bring in that uh, external perspective. When you are sitting in a position both for a parent company and one of the subsidiaries, you have inherent conflicts. For, for instance, in the, the very question as to when, when times are going well, then perhaps everyone is uh, profiting. If there's a stress environment, such as that we're in now with economic headwinds, maybe you wish to withhold or strengthen the capital basis of the individual bank subsidiary. So the very question as to whether profits are repatriated, pushed up to the parent is one that you will be in a conflict situation if you're representing the parent as well as the subsidiary. So, so overall, my recommendation in that regard is really that the governance, and even if you're sitting on the board of the parent company, you should take a view that the appropriate 
governance structures are made are in place for each of the different regulated entities. And that follows through in terms of other aspects of your requirements as a board to sign off, such as uh, aspects of remuneration. If you're sitting on multiple different entities, who is determining your remuneration or which is the remuneration that really drives your incentives? The flip side of this aspect of where do you prioritize in the, the sense of, of conflicts and how do we create these type of long-term incentives across the organization. Another aspect that in, in the past year, so meaning 2019 uh, focus that we've seen from ABA for, for banks and which the Financial Stability Board just put out some consultation document on is outsourcing. Outsourcing obligations and outsourcing oversight includes your obligation across group entities. And for the general public, the largest banking groups, they have a common branding, but most people don't even know which is the legal entity subsidiary that they're contracting with. It is our obligation as board members to know those formalities and also know how critical they are for the organization. So I think that's an aspect that, again, for a board member, you're not responsible on the day-to-day -day management to know those structures, to know how the responsibilities are across the different legal entities within a group. Are you suggesting that the board member of the parent company should also sit in some of the in, in the boards, or at least some of the boards of the of the legal entities. I think that can cause problems. Uh, that that was an issue with Wirecard, that you had the most of the same board members for the parent company, also with the subsidiary regulated bank, and if the bank, in this case, it, it was true, it was a very focused bank that was supporting the activity of the parent company, in part acting on the basis of guarantees from the parent company, meaning that it was not making its independent risk determinations because the risk was driven by the parent company. If also the parent company is driving the strategy and telling you where you should be uh, dedicating your activity and also the controllers were from the parent company, how can we say that the bank could ever say effectively, as a practical matter, no to the parent company? This is not in the interest of the, the bank. It's, it's hard to say that you could carry out those fiduciary uh, responsibilities if the conflicts were that great. Again, the conflicts don't have to be there, but we have to be recognizing them. And when we come under strain, and again, we're in a situation of economic strain right now, that is when the, the conflicts will come to the fore. Okay, let me go to another topic and let me somehow start including already some questions from the floor. Maybe let's try to condense question, uh, answers so that may, we can possibly accommodate more questions because we are already waiting questions from the audience. So let's try to, to at least uh, tackle half of them. Let's move to, um, to regulation. So what kind of implication has the Wirecard case for regulation in two respects? First, to regulation of non-bank financial service providers. But the second, also the supervisory architecture, meaning that you have a bank, as you said, operating in 26 countries, so being really a global entity that at the end of the day is regulated by national regulator and supervisor. Now, irrespective of the quality of these national entities, there are still national entities oversight in a very large bank. So what's your thought on this issue? So I see also uh, various aspects of the questions uh, touch up, upon this. So uh, I'll try to uh, raise hopefully some things that respond to that, although this could be the, the topic alone of a full day seminar. Couple, couple different aspects to this. When we talk about the regulatory environment as it applied to Wirecard and some of the, the current debate as to whether people failed or could have done more or should have done more or we should change 
their competence, we must recognize that there's two separate things. One is the regulator or the licensing authority for the bank or more specialized financial services provider. A separate aspect is the markets regulator. I say markets regulator, the authority with respect to any public company, even if it's not a bank, that is issuing public securities. So market abuse regulation relevant uh, items. And in this case, again, Wirecard was an issuer of both debt and equity securities that were publicly traded on various exchanges uh, throughout Europe. In that case, it has public disclosure requirements, and that uh, flows into the aspect of the auditing and the oversight of the auditors by various government authorities. That would apply and did apply regardless of whether Wirecard was uh, providing regulated financial services. And so, as I say, when one of the, or the primary aspect that led to the downfall of Wirecard was this misstatement of its financial situation, that is primarily relevant to it as a securities issuer. Part of the reason why it was able to propagate this, call it a, a myth or misrepresentation, was that it was tied under the mystique of being a fintech, a disruptor, a new technology provider, so that when people questioned the model and they said, interesting that Wirecard can make these outside profits, how can it do that compared to others? Part of the criticism, including from the former Wirecard management was that, oh, you must not understand our new technology or new disruptive. Yes, we can be more profitable than, than banks because we do things in, in new ways. Partly true, but, but partly uh, fabricated as to what the, the full economic results were in that regard. In terms of whether those aspects of the financial services should themselves be regulated, there, there's different aspects. If we were to take aspects of those business model and then put them and say, you can only do that with a full bank license and all the requirements of the, the banks, then we would not be allowing for technological innovation and a lot of the, the rapid development that we have here. We need to look at the, the purposes of the regulation that we are trying to achieve, the, the principles of, of basic financial regulation. And stepping on my head, and we have a lot of policymakers there. I look back at the first decade of my career as a, a central banker, I'm looking at aspects of financial stability and uh, payment systems and integrity, including for monetary policy transmission aspect. Wirecard failed, some banks took losses, but it certainly did not have a systemic impact, right? A very different lens would be from the consumer protection side. Here, as I said, Wirecard mostly worked in the business to business space. So a lot of, not a lot of consumer facing products, but as an e-money provider, some of its subsidiaries were licensed to hold consumer money. And the, the primary aspect of that regulation is that you must protect customer funds in a type of escrow uh, account or trustee account separate from your operating funds. Wirecard did that, uh, meaning that it did that properly, including in its subsidiaries in the US, in Brazil, in Singapore, in the, the UK. That was not an aspect of its uh, downfall or questionable activities. So that is one of the primary aspects of why we license FinTechs and other payment service providers, again, the consumer protection 
aspects. Other aspects of regulation related to anti-money laundering um, were a, a questionable aspect. Certainly the bank fell within that, but we also know that banks around the, the world are still struggling with some of those aspects, including with new technologies, um, but also using new technologies to address that framework today. So I don't think the aspect again was, or, or that there's a clear answer, yes or no for that activity. I think we need to look at what activity we are trying to, or what is the principle that we're trying to achieve through the financial regulation and then saying, if you're creating a risk in this area, then it should be subject to similar oversight because that's the only way that we have a level playing field and we can really allow people to compete in terms of a better approach. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me dedicate the last 10 and maybe hopefully 15 minutes to the boards. So to what is the responsibility of the boards in this situation, starting from these issues. First, on the governance. So, so far, what would you be saying? These are the key factors that the proper governance structure should have and the boards coming from, of course, the white card cases. So what should the board be very careful that is in place from the governance perspective? So that is the first aspect. And then we move more to financial irregularities and what could the board do then? And then there are some questions of whistleblowing, but let's start with the governance. What are the key factors that went wrong in the wildcard? And therefore, what are the key elements that the board member should make sure they are present? I'm not sure that I'll go into that much details into what went wrong, but- um, For what you can, you can say. Yeah, I, I think I'll move more into the second aspect, but- um, Fundamentally, you, you have structure, and, and that's the, the government side, and then you have the implementation, and that's the, the oversight side. So let, let me give more uh, a couple comments as to the implementation of things that I think people can take away and apply at their boards that might not um, be specific to this individual case. So general applicability. One of the issues that was raised fundamentally for Wirecard and for any of the, the overseers was how did the company make funds or, or how did the, the company profit? And that's a question of understanding the revenue and cost to the company. Sounds like a very simple proposition and, and frankly it is. For any overseer, if they really understand the business of the company and the aspects of where it's profitable, including vis-a-vis -vis its competitors, they should have been able to raise these questions or engage on these questions as to whether the profitability of Wirecard was genuine in, in terms of really a, a market leader, or was it too good to be true? Again, fundamental aspect of if you know what the, the remuneration, you know what the, the costs are, frankly, the numbers wouldn't uh, add up. That's something that can be broken down through different P&Ls, but in the, the wire card statement, it, it was information that would not generally be available to the external public to be able to, to focus in, in such a level of detail, but it should have been, it obviously was uh, available to auditors or examiners, and it should have been available to board members. So the very fact that that's being questioned, uh, maybe a board member should make sure they can answer that for their individual company. Another aspect is that when we look at auditors, of course, they're going to conduct sampling. They're not going to look at every individual transaction. And it's certainly not the role of a, a board member to look into every transaction. But we're not talking about every transaction. We're talking about an aspect of when the board might question if there is a systemic issue here. So I raised the example of potential regularities in terms of acquisitions, if uh, funds were diverted. If something is so fundamental that 
fundamental in the sense of it's above a certain threshold set by your board, maybe in your, your board organizational documents that the management must consult or receive the approval by the board to invest over a hundred million, then that I would suggest is the type of sample, there's not gonna be many based on your threshold, where the board members should follow up. Uh, expect that after the consummation of a transaction, we had estimates that the board approved for them to go ahead, but were the funds actually applied? in that way? Did we two years later see that the revenue streams met the projection when we went forward? I would posit that that's something where board members could have identified some of the irregularities. Or if there are questions raised that maybe they're smaller aspects, whether the structure is in place, including the right oversight to make sure those irregularities are done. Uh, are, are addressed and not repeated. That's a very different aspect. It's a structural oversight and follow-up, different from going into a, a checklist of every single transaction. And that includes, of course, when, when whistleblower framework, uh, whistleblowers have raised questions and, and a number of people have asked about that. Um, there were whistleblowers in, in the sense of some public reporting on the questions about the irregularities and the the overall financial results have already uh, addressed that. There were not otherwise a lot of external indicia or something that was missing that the board needed more to focus its efforts in terms of following up and seeing that there were consequences by the management. What are the steps taken to address these issues so that it will not appear again? That's not a hard question for a board when anything is reported to them. Okay, I think we have already touched uh, upon this uh, whistleblowing topic, as you were saying. Some people were asking, actually, but I couldn't find now the, the question. More directly, whether there is an obligation to whistleblowing of the board members and to whom, eventually, I think it was the question. But I believe, uh, more or less, you have already... Well, I could, I could take one aspect on that. Um, we, yeah. we all have fiduciary duties, and there's aspects of what you can say publicly, but as a, a board member or even a member of the control functions or even external parties, whether it's an, an auditor, uh, a lawyer who might be under confidentiality provisions, or even someone who's come in as a consultant or advisor, I'm not sure that whistleblowing is always the right way, but one thing that you can do is resign. And that is the strongest possible message that you can take. And with respect to certain positions subject to suitability requirements, it often requires an explanation to the regulator as to why you resigned. Personally, I, I would say, and I've, I've offered my resignation at other institutions that I, I've worked at, if I felt uncomfortable with being with them, that is the strongest single message that you can do. Okay, that's a quite a strong statement. <laughs> so let me, let me go to one other aspect, which is, uh, um, first of all, two aspects that are a bit different. One is the role of the independence of the board member. So what is the role of the independence of board member in establishing and effecting corporate governance and whether you would consider the necessity of strengthening the independence criteria? And the second, that maybe is not so related, but in a way, of course, the boards should do more, but maybe there are also measures that can help board members to do their job more or to prevent some of the irregularities. And that is which of the following measures can help to deter and detect accounting irregularities or fraud in publicly listed companies such as Wirecard. Statutory minimum requirement for corporate governance, internal controls and risk management, stronger power independence of external auditors, which we haven't touched upon, but there were also some questions about the external auditors role and the responsibility and the sort of ring fencing within uh, their companies or stronger enforcement power for capital market and audit supervisors? Or do you see other measures? And I promise this at the last question to you for today. Okay, that, that's probably more questions than we could get through. So let me try to get ones that I can be a little bit uh, more specific. 
in this regard. So independence criteria for, for various different parties here. The aspects differ still by jurisdictions within Europe and in particular in some jurisdictions like Germany where Wirecard was established where you have a two-tier board structure which also exists in, in some other jurisdictions. Each and every one of the members of the supervisory board of uh, directors were non-executive independent directors had not worked for the company before. So even when you move from an executive to a non-executive, so they would meet each and every criteria under uh, the strictest aspects of non-executive with the possible exception if you were to initiate a rotation requirement, for example, after 10 years. So clearly the aspect of just saying parties must be independent is not enough to prevent the frauds. I'm certainly a proponent of that. And as I said, including throughout different entities within a group structure, making sure that those regulated entities have the appropriate non-executive and independence aspect. So should be strengthened, but it's not the only aspect. The issue of independence of auditors is one that is being debated. Uh, the UK just passed through some changes in, in that regard. It's one of the aspects that, that Germany and uh, across the European area is looking at changing directly in reaction to the Wirecard case. That is generally discussed in the sense of auditing versus consulting activity. Again, that's an aspect that has important merits and should be in place as a, a prerequisite, but was not the issue in the Wirecard case in the sense that the statutory auditors did not have mandates that would violate any norms in that regard. I'm not saying there wasn't small things on the side, but really within the aspects that would be discussed with any institution. So that was not the cause here. In fact, I can tell you that even the subsidiary bank had a, sec had a separate auditor. The, board, the supervisory non-executive board of directors had brought in another uh, auditor as a follow-up to a question that had been raised by the examination by the competent authority. They had brought in another group. Um, and through that, each and every one of the big four firms had given opinions and advice on the fundamental issues, but had not stopped the fraud, um, having looked at that in the past year. So that alone, I would also suggest, will not answer your question if you don't have the right people and the people, as I said, and, and again, further elaborating on my earlier statement, um, even the external parties, Wirecard had, as I said, the big four involved, it had big name law firms. It had some of the biggest strategic consulting groups. These entities made a lot of money off the firm and, and some of them were looking at the irregularities, but I didn't see any example of one that said, I'm going to resign my mandate or I'm going to say to the board, you can stop paying me now because if I bill millions more over the next six months, the answer is still not gonna change. That, that this doesn't make sense because as I told you, I came in the first week and said, this is entirely implausible. Um, for the, the last aspect for the supervisory authorities, having been a, a former supervisor, I think it's critical that supervisors have the authority to directly engage with the institutions and not just rely on external parties. But um, to my point before that, structure or governance versus implementation. That's nice to say, but if you have someone who has their entire career only as a supervisor, they've never been inside an organization, it would be very difficult for them to realize what operationally does not make sense if they have zero operational experience. And that's something we have to keep in mind. It's not just the structure. Ultimately, it comes down to the people. And that's why I think the aspect of holding people personally responsible, including the obligations each of us have as uh, board members, and I say that I just 
was three hours this morning in a different board uh, meeting, um, that um, persons, I, I think fundamentally what needs to change through Wirecard and the, and the border governance reform is for people to really think the aspect if they are committed enough and to take their responsibilities seriously because the, the personal liability is only growing here. Absolutely. So unless you want to give us your concluding word on what the board should be doing and watch out in particular, taking from, from your experience, I think we can conclude that there is from my side the question because the time at our disposal unfortunately is over. So I don't know if you have your final word. Would you like to have it? I, I think with that, I'll, I'll just say uh, the aspect of challenging that, um, that you need people in place to challenge the management, otherwise you're not being a, a non-executive uh, board member and really to speak up. And if anything else, I, I think one of the aspects that enables us, both the, the management and the board members, is the global movement towards focusing on sustainability and the recognition that governance structures are no longer something to be ignored in terms of, I'm the management, I'm focused on sales and making money and these are all details and I have to check lists so that the regulator leaves me alone. No, even from the markets side and our, our counterparts, our investors, um, our employees, they want to see that we're part of a sustainable company with uh, a mission. And this, when we look at environmental, social and governance, the, the environmental is things that most people can understand, not as relevant on a day-to-day -day aspects for, for banks other than how much energy you use. The social aspects, as I said, is much deeper than diversity of pictures uh, on a website. It should also be diversity of experience and how we, we treat people. But the governance is the one that is the least well-defined. And that's something that, again, I'm happy to be here today. It's what I'm looking at in, in my career. So I uh, hope I'll engage further as a consultant or, or board member with some of the people here and look forward to working uh, with your group here at the FBF um, with the school and promoting these good standards going forward. And uh, thank you very much, James. This has been uh, in a fascinating hour of conversation with you. We have an overwhelming response from the attendees. There are still many questions that are left uh, unanswered because of time. But this has really been a fascinating and very instructive conversation. Thank you so much. And also thanks for somehow your courage to come up and speak about this. Uh, despite all the rumors and the ongoing actions that are still taking place in this case. And thank you for the example that you have given to all of us in your role as a CEO, board member, or whatever other roles you have had in life. So I very much hope that we will continue this conversation in other fora or uh, with the school. And thanks a lot from the side of all of the people that participated today. Thank you so much. And bye-bye to bye. everybody. Bye-bye.